guy that's self-taught on the piano. You know, sometimes as you get older, you get short-term memory loss, and I, I think I have that. Because I have this joke I'm dying to tell you guys, but I'm concerned I've already told it to you. So I'm going to tell it anyway, all right? They won't remember it anyway, right? Okay, good. You heard about the guy that was out hunting with his buddy, and... Uh, <laughs> Have I told this one? <laughs> and he calls 911. And 911 says, 911, uh, what's your emergency? He says, man, I just shot my friend. I think he's dead. The operator says, you think he's dead? Well, go make sure. Puts the phone down. She hears, boom, boom. He comes back and says, okay, now what? <laughs> I know I got a warped sense of humor. <clears throat> My sister's fault. <laughs> um, you know, I believe with God there are no accidents. you believe that? Amen. I mean, God has all of our life planned out before we're ever born. He already knows everywhere we're going to be, when we're going to be there. And he puts us where we're going to be for a particular reason. Do you believe that? Amen. Okay. Good, because you're here today for a reason. There's one Sunday a year when I preach on money, and that's this Sunday. <laughs> when uh, my sweet great niece called and she said we asked Nadia what she wants for Christmas for her birthday she said she wants to come hear you preach I said okay but I got to tell you <laughs> there's one Sunday a year I teach on money and this is it she said well I'm glad you told us but we're coming anyway so uh, I'm glad y'all are here and I'm glad y'all are here and uh, you know it's not my job to be the Holy Spirit in your life it's not. My job is not to guilt you in doing things that you're supposed to be doing. My job is simply to teach the Word of God to you, tell you what God's Word says, and then let you and God, here's a Bible term, work out your own salvation in fear and trembling. That doesn't mean work to get saved. It means now that you're saved, work out what all God wants you to do in that salvation process. And my job is to teach you what the book says and your job then is to talk to God about it and let him deal with you about that. We're talking this month about the exchange, how we, we've learned to exchange the old character for the new character, the old self for the new self. Today we're going to talk about exchanging that which we thought was ours, and now we realize it's really his. And we're exchanging ours for his now and learning to give back to God that which he has blessed us with. Uh, the teaching today is really for Christians. So if you're not a Christian, you're off the hook. It doesn't apply to you. However, I will say that the Christian principles on giving are used in the marketplace even with non-Christians who practice the biblical principles of giving and they work in the marketplace for non-Christians as well. But as far as does this apply to you and are you required by God to do certain things? Nope, you're off the hook. The only thing you're required to do is give your life to Christ. That's what he wants you to do. But today we're not going to talk about that. It applies to those of us who are saved. We've given our life to Christ. Here's what a Christian is. A Christian is someone who patterns their life as much like Christ as they possibly can. That's by definition what a Christian is. Someone who lives as much like Jesus as they know how. And I contend that when it comes to Christian giving, that there are only two re reasons that Christians do not give to God like God wants them to. The first one is because they've never been taught. They, they've gone to church and heard some guy say, you ought to be given, you ought to be given, but never taught what the book says about it. The second is that they're in rebellion toward God. They know what God says, but they choose not to do that. Now, we know that sin is when someone chooses their way over God's way, right? That's sin. James 4, 17 says, if a man knows the good he should do and does not do it, to him it is Sin. And that Greek word translates cherished sin. It's like we've said this. I know the good I should do in this particular area, but you know what? I've done all these other things. I've given all that to you, God. I'm going to keep this sin. This is my cherished sin. I know you want me to do this, but you know what? I'm not doing this. That's when we've chosen our way over God's way. Well, I, I choose to believe that most Christians are not in rebellion. I told John... When he first came to work here, I said, you know, John, here's what I found about Christians. Most Christians want to do the right thing. But sometimes they just need to be reminded what the right thing is. 
And if you just help them to understand the right thing, that's what a Christian wants to do. It's like, okay, remember my attitude about, about studying the Word of God is this. I don't care what the truth is. I just want to know truth. So give me truth, and I'm okay with that. So I'm going to give you truth today. First of all, you know I've taught you that I believe this book is God's mind revealed to man. So if you want to know what God thinks about a thing, read the mind of God. This is God's mind. So whatever question you have, whatever's bothering you, whatever's scaring you, whatever's causing you to live in fear, you don't have to do that. God has an answer right here. Read the mind of God. And around here, we recite this from time to time. So if you believe these words, after I say them, you repeat them to me. I believe the Bible. It is the Word of God. Every word of God is true. Where what the Bible says is different from my beliefs or my behavior or my actions or attitudes, I will change by the power of God's Holy Spirit. Now, here's what we just said. I believe this is God's Bible, and whatever I learn in here, I need to be doing, I'm going to start doing that. Whatever I learn, I need to stop doing, I'm going to, I'm going to stop doing those things. I'm going to change based on what I know God wants me to do. Now, with that in mind, let me back up and, and go to, to what our month is about. Every January, we, we study about being good stewards, and we call it Stewardship Month. And a, a steward is someone who takes care of somebody else's possessions, a manager. When I go to the, to the uh, train stop to go to San Antonio and visit my grandkids, I give my baggage to the steward. He takes my bags and he goes and puts it on the train. And he is taking care of my possessions. Just because I've given them to him does not mean they belong to him. They're still my possessions. He's just taking care of my possessions for me. And so with that understood, I want us to understand the basic principle of stewardship is found in Psalm 24 and verse 1. Here's what it says. The earth is the Lord's. And everything in it. The world and all who live in it. So here's what that says. The earth is the Lord's. What's, what, what's, what's on the earth? Grass, trees, water. And he says, the earth is the Lord's. In other words, if that's his, our job is to take care of his earth. The earth is the Lord's and everything in it. What's in it? Gold, silver, minerals, um, all come out of uranium. All of those belong to God, not us. 20% belongs to us and 80% to the Russians. But, you know, the uranium is supposed to be ours. It's supposed to be God's. And so the earth is the Lord's. Everything in the earth is the Lord's. Then it says, and the world. That means everything out around here. The stars, the moon, other planets. And it says, and all who live in it. That would mean if there happens to be somebody on another planet, they too belong to God. But forget about them for now. Those of us who live here, we belong to God. So grasp that. Everything that exists belongs to God. You want to know why? Because in Genesis 1-1 he says, In the beginning God created the heavens and the earth. Well, the creator of all things certainly owns all things. And so it's not my yard. If I let it die and don't take care of that grass, I'm letting God's grass die. If my paint begins to peel on my house, that's not my house. That's just the house God's allowed me to take care of on his behalf. And I need to take care of God's house. This is not my suit. This is God's suit. I just get to keep it pressed and wear it. I guess the best illustration for me is my Uncle J.O. who was a great godly Christian multi-multi-millionaire. And he, back in the 80s, he lost $12 million dollars. In the oil business. You know, when the oil goes down, CC, you understand something about the oil going down? And I said to him about two years later, I said, Uncle Joe, I know you lost at least $10 million. He said, 12. I said, But you never changed your countenance. You've always been happy and jovial at Christmas. We're all together. Nobody ever know you ever lost anything. How do you do that? And he said, I'm surprised as a preacher I have to explain this to you. He said, that was not my $12 million. That was God's $12 million. He just parked it in my checking account for a few years. And he allowed me to have it and take care of it and work out of it. 
But at some point, he decided somebody else needed that, so he took his money back and gave it to somebody else. Do you know that's really how he believed? My family taught me well about this kind of stuff. It's not mine. It all belongs to God. So stewardship involves not just 10% of money. It involves everything. How My relationship with my grandson. Fine looking grandson. My relationship with my sister and my nephews and my nieces. My relationship with my wife. My relationship with you. Everything that we are, guys, we're to be good stewards of. Our time. Do we waste our time? Do we get up in the mornings late? Instead of getting up and getting going and doing things... All of that is being a steward of what God has entrusted our care. Now, when it comes to giving, God has broken down giving in two ways. In tithes and offerings. In Malachi chapter 3 and verse 8, and we're going to, I'll cover it in detail in just a minute, but in, in Malachi 3 8, God's, God asks this question. He says, will a man rob God? And yet you ask me, how have we robbed you? And then God answers him, he says, in tithes and offerings. So the first thing I want you to understand is tithes and offerings are not the same thing. They're two separate things, all right? And so you can rob him of tithe and still give an offering, or you can rob him of offering and still give a tithe. All right, they're, they're two separate things we're going to understand together. So if you were to go to Leviticus chapter 27, and we have it on the screen so you don't have to go there. I did it for, for speed's sake this morning. Here's what it says. The tithe of everything from the land whether grain from the soil or fruit from the trees belongs to the Lord, it is holy to the Lord. Verse 31 says, If a man redeems any of his tithe, he must add a fifth of the value to it. That's 20% interest God's charging. He said, If you decide you can't pay your rent this week, so you're going to take my money and go pay your rent? He says, Bring me 20% back on it. Then in verse 32 he says, He defines tithe. He says, The entire tithe of the herd and flock. That is... Every tenth animal that passes under the shepherd's rod will be holy to the Lord. So if you want a Bible definition for what a tithe is, it's one-tenth. One-tenth. All right. That being said, here's what I want you to understand. The tithe is a tenth of our income, and that's, which, that's, that's what God just says, give me the tithe. It's mine. He could have said, here, I'm going to give you all this money, $10,000. I want you to give me 9000 of it back. You keep 1000 but he didn't do that. He did it just the other way around. He said, give me a tenth, you keep 90. And you'll live better on 90, giving me a tenth, than you would if you kept the whole, ten, uh, the whole 100%. Now, either God's a liar or that's true. You decide. Then the second thing he says, you've robbed me in tithes, but he also says you've robbed me in offerings. What's an offering? An offering is that which you give to God above the tithe. That which is not required. Okay, he didn't require that. As a matter of fact, there's a scripture that says, um, God doesn't want us to give reluctantly or under compulsion for God loves a cheerful giver. And that's why some people don't give to God, period. They say, well, I can't be happy about it. And God said, if I can't be happy, don't give it. We heard about the preacher, we'll just keep passing plates until you get happy. <laughs> but the reality is, that passage is not talking about the tithe. It's talking about an offering they were raising for some folks in another city. And he says, listen, if you can't give this money to them and be happy about it, above the tithe, if you can't give and be happy, then don't give it. Give the tithe. I don't care if you're happy about that or not. You can give that. Matter of fact, I, I like to quote my mama. I tell you, in First Mama chapter 3, it says, Mama used to say, you're not going to live on God's tithe. Everybody tithes. Every Christian tithes. Some, some Christians tithe to the, to the Lord through the church and get God's blessing for doing that. But other people tithe to the washing machine repairman, to the automobile mechanic. She said, but as a Christian, God is not going to let you keep his 10%. You might as well give it to him to get blessed on it because otherwise you're going to give it to somebody else for fixing something, but you're not going to live on God's money. And she made a believer out of me, and I believe that ever since then. So let's break this down and see about tithing, first of all. I want to give you a history of tithing. If you were to look in Genesis chapter 14 and verse 20, now this is before the law is even given. There is no Ten Commandments. There's no law. In Genesis chapter 14 and verse 20, Abraham, uh, at this time called Abram, says, and, and blessed be God most high who delivered your enemies into your hand. Then Abram gave him, Melchizedek, the, the, the high priest, a tenth of everything before there was law. 
And then again, Jacob does the same thing in, in Genesis 28, verse 20. And then in Genesis chapter 20, verse 23, we see that the Ten Commandments are given. All right, we all know that's the law, and that's when the Ten Commandments came to us. But then, after the Ten Commandments were given, in Exodus chapter 23, verse 16 through 19, 16 and 19, we see where they talk about the first fruits. And he says they gave a first fruit of the crops. In other words, bring the best of your first fruits. When you first get your money, give God his first. Somebody the other night, who was it? Um, David Boyd, I think it was, was saying, when, when they get, when they, when, when it comes time to pay bills, the first thing they pay is they pay God. They give God his 10%, and then they figure out how they're going to pay the other bills. That's the first one. And then they work it out. That's what Exodus chapter 23, verse 16 and 19 is talking about, the first fruits. But then we see under the law, Leviticus 27, 30, that we read a while ago, where the tithe is defined as one-tenth, okay? But then in Malachi chapter 3, and I'm not putting that up there. I want you to turn there. You can find the last book of the Old Testament. If you don't have a Bible, there's one in the back of the pew, one under the front of the pew. Go to Malachi chapter 3, last, <clears throat> last book of the Old Testament, <clears throat> and I want to do some teaching for just a minute. Penny, your penny. Kaylee, your grandfather used to say, um, Preacher man, someday you're not going to be pastor anymore. You're going to be teaching at the seminary. Because when I come to church, you don't preach yet, but you teach me. And so I'm going to teach something. Phelps would be proud of that. In um, Malachi chapter 3, verse 8, there's a conversation between the prophet Malachi and the people. And here's what happened. God is so mad at, at his people at this time that he comes to Malachi and he says, I want you to talk to them. Here's how it's going to go, Malachi. I'm going to put words in your mouth that they would say, and you're going to say, okay, this is what you would say, and then I'm going to put words in your mouth that I would say, and you're going to say, but now here's what God's answer is. And then you're going to say what their response would be. Then I'm going to put my words, you're going to say what I would say. So Malachi is carrying on the conversation for them and him. Here's where it starts. He says, um, will a man rob God? That's what they would ask. They'd say, will a man rob God? And God would say, yeah, you rob me. But you ask, how do we rob you? And God says, in tithes and offerings. He says, you are under a curse, the whole nation of you, because you're robbing me. Then he says, bring half of the tithe into the storehouse. No. He says, bring the whole tithe. It didn't say take half and give it to the local church and give half to a TV preacher. It said give, bring the whole tithe into the storehouse. We'll get to the TV preacher in a minute. <laughs> bring the whole tithe into the storehouse that there may be food in my house. And then he says, test me in this. Do you know that that's the only place in the entire Word of God where he says it's okay to test him? Everywhere else in the Bible, he says, do not put the Lord your God to a test. But when it comes to money, he says, you know what? Put me to the test. I dare you. You try me and see if I don't do what I say. He says, test me in this, says the Lord Almighty, and see if I will not throw open the floodgates of heaven and pour you out so much blessing that you will not have room enough for it. I will prevent the pests from devouring your crops and the vines in your fields will not cast their fruit, says the Lord Almighty. Now, here's what he just said. He said, I'll tell you what you do. You give me what I ask of you. Now, remember, they're an agrarian society. They make their money through growing fruits and vegetables, okay? And he says, so here's what, here's what I'm going to say. You do what I tell you to do. And he said, I'm going to pour you out so much blessing. Here's, here's what I'm going to I said, I'm going to become your private exterminator. I'm going to put all the pest control people out of business because he says... I'm going, to, I'm going to patrol your fields, and I'm going to prevent the pests from devouring your crops. Now, see, what that means is you're not going to have as much rot in the field because I'm going to take care of that. And he says, not only that, I'm going to see to it that the vines don't cast their fruit. See, when the, when the grapes fall off the vine, they're no good anymore. He says, I'm going to leave them on the vine long enough that you can make more money. But he says, I'm going to take care of it. I'm going to see that you have all you need, and I'm going to be the one that takes care of that. I don't know about you, but I like God. Be my pest exterminator, don't you? And he says to me, Olin, you can trust me. You're not going to be able to see how it's going to happen, but you can test me and I'll prove myself to you. Now, that's the teaching of the Old Testament. 
And that's where so many Christians today, they say, you know, preacher, but that's all Old Testament. When you turn the page, you come in the New Testament, it doesn't talk about tithing in the New Testament. Oh, no, 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 no. Turn to Matthew 23, 23. Not only does it teach it in the New Testament, guess who does the teaching? Jesus. Jesus. Look what he says. He says, What are you teachers of the law and Pharisees? You hypocrites. He said, You give a tenth of your spices, your mint, your dill, and your cumin. But you have neglected the more important matters of the law, justice, mercy, and faithfulness. He says, you should have practiced the latter, that is, justice, mercy, and faithfulness, without neglecting the former, that is, the tithing. So here's what Jesus said. Listen, don't worry about babies. You know what? This church didn't have a baby one in it when I got here. You know, I love the babies crying and kids playing around. You know, who cares? That means there's life here, right? So let them cry. Let them cry. So here's what that verse says. It says, you, you get all hung up. You're so legalistic. You make sure you give an exact tenth on all your, all your coming, your deal, all, all the fruits of your field. But he said the thing you don't do is you don't, you don't practice the rest of it. You don't do justice and mercy and faithfulness. He says, man, you should have been practicing justice, mercy, and faithfulness without neglecting to do the other as well. In other words, keep tithing. Now, I don't know about you, but if Jesus says I should do it, Pretty good indication I ought to be doing it, don't you think? Again, you get to work out your own salvation. You and God can take that up. I'd just say this, though. If Abraham commenced it and Jacob continued it and Moses commanded it and Jesus commended it, who are we to cancel it? He's got a pretty good thing going here. You know, uh, I taught my kids about tithes and offering like this. I said to Chris and Nate when they're at different times, Mowing the grass is the tithe. As my child, you're going to mow the grass. And you're not going to get paid for it. It's not an option. Every week, you mow the grass. Hey, and I'd like you to clean those weeds out of the flower bed too. But if you can't be happy about cleaning the weeds out of the flower bed, you don't have to. That's an offering. But you're going to mow the grass. Now, I wanted the flower beds cleaned out. But if they couldn't do it and be happy about it, okay, you just can't do it. But I wanted them to clean them out. Sad thing is, some people just are not cheerful about their giving. Some people just get ecstatic and cannot. They just love to give. <laughs> Dorothy Phelps. I told this at her funeral. Um, used to, we had a little bitty church, a little poor congregation. And when we didn't make budget by offering time on Sunday night, I would come back to the pulpit at the end of the service, and I'd tell the church we're this much short, and we'd have to make it up. And every week when I'd say we're 150 short, Dorothy Phelps said, I'll give it. Every week, 300 short, I'll give it. Finally, I said, Miss Dorothy, you've got to quit that. Why? We're short. I said, because you're cheating other people out of the joy of giving well, okay, I won't do it anymore then. But just know if they don't give it, I'll give it. <laughs> but that wasn't enough for her. And I'm not just telling this because you are here. They've heard it before. She's the lady I told you about that was sitting behind little couples in her church. And when they would stand up to sing, you should stick $500 in their purse. And they'd call the church the next day and say, Pastor, we think somebody lost some money. Because when we got home, my wife found $500 in a purse. We don't know what to do with it. And it happened so often that finally Lana, my secretary, would say, nobody lost it. God had an angel sitting behind Sunday. See, she found the joy of giving. It wasn't hard for her. It wasn't like extracting teeth. She didn't get mad because she had. It was a joy to her. Her attitude was, it's not mine. I'm just going to do what God would do. You know that little wristband everybody used to wear? What would Jesus do? What would Jesus do? He would sit behind a little couple that was about to have a utility shut off. I think he'd drop money in her purse, don't you? See, that's the joy of giving. That's the offering. That's the, you say the tithe is like the floor. That's where you just start. 
But then when you give offerings above that, that's where the joy comes. Now, where would you give the offerings to? Uh, you can give to missions here through our church or a uh, building fund. Or if you've you got a favorite TV preacher, send it to them, you know. Send it to Joel. He's a good guy. He preaches most of my sermons. <laughs> you know, it's okay to give to other ministries. But you give to them above the tithe. And you give out of the abundance of your heart. I just say this to you. You know, we know that if we don't give, we're choosing our way over God's way. And what did James 4.17 say? That's sin. But that's up to you. I'm never going to stand back there at the door and try to shame you into giving. I'm never going to talk to you about your money. I'm not going to do that. This is between you and God. My job, like I said, is to teach you what it says, give it to you, and say, okay, what are you going to do about it? Some of you right now are saying, man, preacher, if I gave God 10% of my income, I wouldn't be able to pay my bills. You're going to be so surprised. When you can trust God to do that, and you do that first, God will show you ways to work out the rest of it. If I could have people stand right now and give testimony, if I just said, okay, if, if you've seen this come true, you'd be surprised the folks who would stand up and say, yeah, it was hard for us when we first started doing it. See, I can't, I can't share that because it was never hard for me. My mama taught me from a child, if I got a dollar, I'd give a dime to God. So I just grew up. It's just nothing for me. I, it's never been hard. And for others, I just have to say, I don't know how it works. I know this, when Tommy and I first got married and we came to the little church, sister will remember this, but they paid me $142 a week. That was my salary. And, uh, and thank God Tommy had a good job at an accounting firm, and so it was income tax season. She was working 60 and 80 hours a week. That's how we paid her bills. But I can remember we came to one week, and I said to her, after we pay tithe and we pay our bills, we're going to have $10 for groceries this week. And with a big old smile, she said, we can do it. And we had beans and beans <laughs> and beans for breakfast. But we got through the week because we were not going to disobey God. And God blessed us and has blessed us ever since. He'll do the same for you. That's my teaching. All right? Now, here's what I want you to do. When you came in today, there's, there should have been a card like this in your, in your pew. I want you to take that card. And um, now, yes, I'm talking to our members now, okay? And now, if y'all want to do this and take it back to your home church and hand that to your pastor, he'll probably go, really? That'd be great. But I want you to notice something on here. Go to the very bottom of, the, of that card first thing and look at that, the two lines at the very bottom. It says this. I understand this card to be a promise to the Lord and not a pledge to the church. And I further understand that I will not be contacted if for some reason I'm unable to keep this commitment. And that's the truth. Okay? If you make a commitment to God, you can't keep it. Nobody's ever going to say a word to you about it. But here's what we're going to do. Go to the top now on the left-hand side under the word exchange. Here's what that first thing says. Believing the tithe and offering to be a command of God and the beginning place of Christian giving, I will be obedient to God's basic requirement of a steward. And in just a moment, not now, but if you're going to do that, you're going to give at least the tithe. You'll put a check in that box. And now that where's this general fund. Now, here's where we get confused every year. When the trustees get back here and start trying to figure this out, some folks will put down what they're going to give on a monthly basis. That's okay. But be sure and put monthly out beside it. Or otherwise, we think that means weekly. If you're going to give that every week, whatever it is, then put weekly beside it. And if you're going to give... Every other week, that's called bi-weekly. Just put bi-weekly outside, okay? And then the second line says, I will commit myself to a weekly faith promise offering for missions. If you're going to give to God to missions above your tithe, and I think last week, that testimony last week, when we found out last week that one of our missionaries, my brother's ministry in the jail ministry, they've seen over 600 Aryan Brotherhood come to Christ through the ministry that you and I support. That's pretty good. 600 Aryan Brotherhood. Um, I think that's worth a little money 
to take care of seeing those guys come to Jesus. And then the last one says, uh, oh, and then you'll put the same thing out here, mission. It was going to be weekly or monthly or whatever. And then the building fund, I commit myself to weekly faith promise offering to the building and retirement, uh, and you'll put that over there. Then what we're going to do, after you do that, here's what I want you to do. After you fill all that in, at the very top above where it says, teach me to exchange my treasure, I want you to write your name. I never understood when people take out a credit card or they go to charge something at Dillard's or Sears, they have no trouble signing their name. But when it comes to filling out a commitment card to God, I'm not putting my name down there. Here's what we're going to do with the card. The trustees today will look at those cards. They'll tally them up so we'll know if it matches the budget that we put together last week. And if, if not, then the deacons have to make an adjustment somehow. And then Jackie is going to put that card in the mail and send it back to you. We don't write it down. We don't keep it. We don't have any idea. That's why I said a while ago, no one will contact you because we won't have a clue what you said you're going to do. That's between you and God. We send this back to you for this reason. You need to lay down on your chest of drawers or put it on the mirror and wherever, wherever you get dressed on Sunday so you'll be reminded of what you told God you would trust him to take care of for you this next year. Okay? So let's just take a moment. We'll have prayer. This is the coldest invitation I'll give all year long. But I'm, I'm on us to pray. I want you to pray. Ask God what he wants you to give to the general fund. That's the tithe. And then to missions or building, whatever, above that. Okay? But let's pray. You talk to God. I'll talk to God on your behalf as well. All right? Let's pray together. Father God, I thank you so much for the reminder every January, this last Sunday of January every year, to be reminded myself of your blessed promises to take care of me, to take care of my family if we will trust you. Lord, it's not my money anyway. It's all yours. And I just get to take care of it. And so, Lord, if, if you ask the 10%, I give it to you. Lord, we, we're going to give to missions what you tell us to give. We're going to talk to you about it, and we're going to negotiate with you. And if you tell us to give 20 a week, we'll give 20. If you say give 30, we'll give 30. But whatever you tell us to give to missions above the tithe, we'll do that. And so, Lord, today I pray that as our church family making their decision about how to commit your money back to you, that they'll listen to you, figure out what a tithe is, and Lord, put Malachi to the test where you said, test me and see if I will not throw open the floodgates of heaven and pour you out so much blessing, you will not be able to receive it all. We trust you in Jesus' name. Amen. Okay.